You found a podcast where you'll hear the truth, and we will praise Jesus' name. We stand for the Bible and won't back down from it, although it don't bring much fame. Some folks will like it, some will try to deny it, but God's Word will always stand true. It's been tried in the fire, still. Hello, friends, faithful listeners. It's time for the Pod King Bible Study. I'm your co-host, Donald King, and I'm joined by the host of this study, Brother Donnie King. On this podcast, we study the Bible from its original languages so we can understand the Word of God more clearly. We look at current events and news in light of Scripture, and we also examine some of the things going on within our culture from a biblical perspective. This is Friday, March the 22nd, special edition number 126, Giants and Babylonian Gods. In our last episode, we finished up the ninth chapter of John. And we saw how the story of the man who was born blind evolved. He schooled the religious leaders by reminding them that God doesn't hear sinners. And then he told them Jesus couldn't have done anything unless he was of God. He said this because Jesus was the one who opened his eyes. Jesus met back up with this man and revealed his identity to him. And at that point, the man worshipped him. Then Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, and they didn't take it well. But if you had not heard this study, give it a listen. In today's study, we go back in time and uncover some very intriguing portions of history. We dig into the history of Babylon, some of their books and teachings, along with a certain group of beings. We also talk about first Enoch could be seen in the writing of Peter and Jude. We look at the similarities between the biblical account of Genesis 6 along with the Babylonian records. We dive in deep today, but we believe you will benefit from today's discussion. Put on your diving gear and jump in with us today. Now for the teaching of God's Word and the lesson for today. I'll turn it to the host of this podcast, Brother Donnie King. Well, we are thrilled to have you join us here at the Pod King Bible Study once again. Yes, sir. We have another weird lesson coming to you right here in McAllister, Oklahoma. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean by calling this a weird lesson? You haven't even heard it yet. Well, and to top it all off, you said another weird lesson. What do you mean? Well, I was just going by your title once again, Giants and Babylonian Gods. Sound more like a fictional book title rather than a Bible study to me. After the study on March the 8th that we did, I figured you would see where we was heading to from there. (laughs) Well, I reckon my x-ray vision isn't working, or it won't allow me to see that far off. Well, either way, we're glad to know that you've joined us for this topic today, whether you see it as weird or interesting. Hey, honestly, I'm glad for all our listeners, too. I know they could have tuned in to other things, but God knows there are a lot of things out there for people to tune into, but some of it isn't worth wasting your time on. I agree with that. And as it gets closer to the Lord's return, I believe we need to be focusing more on the Lord and his word than we ever have before. Yeah, says the guy who has his own Bible study. No, I'm being serious here. This is truly why I do this study. Well, there's a little bit of an interesting story behind this. So why don't you share it real quick before we get started today? Well, it was about two years ago. I was reading a book by J. Sidlow Baxter, and at one point in the book, he was talking about how marketers push for a new product. They call it flooding the market. That means that you're going to begin to see advertisements everywhere. Everything you do, you're going to see that product being advertised. He asked the question, why don't we as Christians flood the market with Jesus? And as Paul Harvey used to say, and now you know the rest of the story. That's right. So I got to thinking about it, and I decided to see how much we could impact the world for the kingdom of God. Well, I will say it has certainly had an impact, and hopefully it will all come to light when we get to heaven. I sure hope so. I've always been more of a laid-back kind of guy, so it's really completely against my nature to do something that would put me out front. So it's very rewarding to see God using this. It really is, but he won't be able to use this show until we get it going. I can take a hint. Okay, so we finished up on March the 8th with who or what was the serpent. And then towards the end, we brought up several things of which we're going to tie in with today. No, that's what I was afraid of. (laughs) Yeah, we were talking about the ancient Mesopotamian literature and the fact that it has many points of connection back to Genesis chapter 1 through 11. And it also includes the story of a catastrophic flood. It even tells about a large boat that saved all kinds of animals and humans. This literature even mentioned a group of sages, the Apkalu, who possessed great knowledge in the period before the flood. 
<laughs> what in the world is an Opkalu? Well, the Opkalu were believed to be divine beings, and most of them were considered as evil. After the flood, the offspring of these Opkalu were said to have a human parent and were believed to be two thirds Opkalu. Oh, boy. Now, this is starting to sound very familiar to me. Well, that's the point, and if you've listened to our last study, you know where this is going now. Mesopotamian historians recorded that these Opkalu mated with human women and produced quasi-divine offspring. The connections of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 with this are impossible to miss. Yeah. The two-thirds divine description is especially noteworthy since it precisely matches the description of the Mesopotamian hero Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh reveals that Gilgamesh was considered a giant who had great knowledge in the pre-flood era. <laughs> the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, that almost sounds like a cartoon or something. Well, it's an actual book, and <laughs> it's got a lot of history in it of the Mesopotamians. In the Mesopotamian flood story, there's a text also known as the Era Epic, and it's E-R-R-A Epic. It's where the Babylonian high god Marduk, he punished the evil Opkalu by banishing them to the subterranean waters deep inside the earth, which is also known as the Opsu. You know, once again, this is also very similar to what the Bible portrays about the fallen angels. That's the point I'm getting to. And this Opsu was considered part of the underworld. And if you remember from our last study, the serpent was cast there. I want everyone to understand, I am not propagating this as a legitimate historical fact in regard to the god Marduk or what all he did or what all that they believed concerning these gods. But the fact of the matter stands that there's some very interesting parallels right here. I know, but, you know, those people recorded this information in that particular way. That's right. And Mesopotamians worship Marduk just as we worship Jesus. It just stands to reason that if they believed that God did something, they would attribute it to the God that they worshiped. Yeah, I can follow that line of thinking. Well, allow me to give the audience an example. Let's say that my family was going down to Haiti to do some mission work. All right. Haiti's national religion is voodoo. And a terrible storm all of a sudden was beginning to wreak havoc on the island. As my family would begin praying to the Lord for safety, somewhere on that same island, there'd be witch doctors who would begin interceding with their enchantments. If all of a sudden the storm suddenly stopped and it went away from us, my family would praise God that he showed mercy on us. Yeah, and rightfully so. But guess what? The witch doctors would also think whatever God or spirit they had implored, thinking that their prayers worked also. If a Haitian historian were to write an article concerning what took place, do you think they would articulate the point of how Jesus came through again? No. They would proclaim how their voodoo witch doctors called on the right God or spirit that made the storm back away. That's exactly right. And so their historical record keeping would be correct. But how it happened would be wrong. Can you see how the Mesopotamian story that has been recorded for years, it could be correct in its historical records? But it's wrong on who they credit with the work. Wow. You know, I never thought of it like that before, but it makes perfect sense. It does. So what they recorded may not be false, but who they put the names and attribute it to could be the part that's false. There was a great flood. There were these things that took place, but it wasn't the names that they called them by. The Mesopotamians claimed that Marduk cast these Opkalu or these sages to the underworld after having relations with human women. But before he did, they began to produce giant offspring around the time of a great flood. Well, to me, the parallels between these accounts are clear and unmistakable. Yes. Well, the banishment of these sinister divine beings to beneath the earth is very significant. I noted a few weeks ago that this element of the story that's found in Second Peter in the book of Jude is not found within the Old Testament. Yeah, I do remember that. It isn't found in the Old Testament, but it is found in First Enoch and in the New Testament, which indicates that the Jewish writers between the Testaments knew about the Mesopotamian context about Genesis 6 and verses 1 through 4. Let me read that for you in Genesis 6 and 1 through 4, and let us get that in our minds. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. 
Okay, so the transgression before the flood is told in many Jewish texts from the intertestamental period, and one of these books portrayed the divine offenders as coming to earth to fix the mess that we know as humankind and to provide them with leadership through their great knowledge. Okay, so now we know this is fictional, but yet they're describing something with a type of knowledge that they supposedly got from somewhere. Reckon where this knowledge came from. Wasn't God. They were trying to help, but once they assumed a fleshly body, they failed to resist its urges. That's just wild. It's always seemed to me that there were some things going on right before the flood, but there just wasn't enough evidence given to figure it all out. Now, I'm not going to say I'm 100% on board with this yet, but it's making for an interesting discussion so far. It is believable. Well, the more common version of what went on is found in Genesis 6, of course, but in other historical writings, it's also found in First Enoch chapter 6 down through 11. This is the version which Peter and Jude would know. Ultimately, it helped shape the writings that we have in our New Testament. Now, how do you know that for sure? Well, the story from First Enoch begins very much like Genesis 6. Let me just read you a portion of this. And when the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. And the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, Come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget for ourselves children. Right here, you can tell several similarities, and you can tell that they took Genesis 6 and they reworded it in this writing. Okay, once again, before anybody gets nervous or scared, I'm not advocating that we all need to throw away the Bible and go with First Enoch. I'm not saying we need the Bible and First Enoch. I'm just telling you this is what somebody believed, and they wrote about it, and it was very common to believe around the time of Christ and the time of Peter and Jude. First Enoch's account has the watchers descending down on Mount Hermon. You know, that's a place that factors into biblical history in many ways. Yes, it does. And we're already familiar with the term watcher from an earlier episode where we dealt with Daniel chapter 4. Yeah, Daniel is the only passage in the Bible that specifically uses the term watcher to describe the holy ones of God's counsel, isn't it? That's correct. And right here is something else that I feel is pretty amazing. The book of Daniel is situated in Babylon. If you want more proof of that, go back to Daniel chapter 1, read verses 1 through 7. Babylon is one of the main cities in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is where all of these epics and all of these books originated from. The Epic of Gilgamesh, all of these different things that I've been talking about. And that's also where they worship Marduk. Babylon worship Marduk. Mesopotamia worship Marduk. All of these things tied together. Are there any other connection points between First Enoch and Genesis 6 account? The offspring of the watchers, or the sons of God, in Enoch were called giants. First Enoch chapter 7 calls them giants. Here's another fact that I find intriguing. The Dead Sea Scrolls is the largest find of definitive biblical texts in history. Yeah, I know that there were several texts that was preserved for years, but the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was pretty significant. Yeah, well, what they found at Qumran proved that the old manuscripts and the scrolls were correct by lining up perfectly with the existing ones. When they had copies of Isaiah, when they found that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was word for word. They were perfectly intact with one another. Among all of the biblical texts that was found, though, there was also several copies of First Enoch found at Qumran. Oh, really? Now, that's an interesting twist I wasn't expecting. Yeah, well, some fragments of First Enoch among the Dead Sea Scrolls even gave names for some of the giants. Other texts that retell the same story, they do the exact same thing. And you know what's startling? The most startling thing about this is that they incorporate the same names for the exact same giants. See what I was talking about when I warned the people to get ready for another weird lesson? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that it's weird as much as just odd hearing historical accounts you've never heard before and then fictional books that you've never read before. Yeah, maybe. The Book of Giants exists only in fragments, but it names several of the giants who existed after the flood. They were the offspring of the watchers who had relations with women. Guess what? One of the names of these giants just so happens to be Gilgamesh, which is the main giant in the Mesopotamian book, The Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, what do you think about that? <laughs> okay, 
And so I see how all this is tying together. But what bothers me is that you're using a lot of outside sources to prove this argument. Okay, and I understand those worries. But in order to prove the Bible correct, scholars have to use a lot of outside sources that prove the authenticity of Scripture. You've got to look at it this way. You've got to find historical writings that mentions the Scripture and mentions these actual people that were living and that there really was a prophet Jeremiah and that he really was imprisoned by a certain king and he really was led into captivity in this certain place in this certain time. And so when you find all of the historical accounts are accurate, then you can say, well, the Scripture is definitely true. Well, I reckon you're right, so go on with what you were saying. Okay, so these Apkalu, they were considered as the sons of God. These were the sages, those wise ones. These are those watchers that came down from heaven. And, if you will, they are the sons of God of Genesis 6. All of this ties in with several other points that we've been studying for several weeks now. Yeah, the sons of God are angelic or spirit beings, so this is very similar. That's right. Well, figurines of the Apkalu have been found by Mesopotamian archaeologists. They were referred to by the Mesopotamians as Matsuri. All right, Matsuri means watchers. Hey, some people might be wondering why you're detailing all this information here. Well, I'm laying out historical proof of what we're about to unfold from within our Bibles. One of the biggest debates concerning Genesis 6 and 1 through 4 is the meaning of the word Nephilim. Oh, well, yeah, well, this is a really touchy debate for a lot of people. That's true. And a lot of people have said that that word Nephilim doesn't mean anything. Some people says it means fallen ones. Some people says it means giants. Some people says it means this, that. Okay, so we've got to determine what we're going to believe about that. I've laid out all of this information to show you what the ancient world believed concerning this. We've seen from the Mesopotamian context that the Apkalu were believed to be divine beings. They mated with human women and produced giant offspring. We've also seen these beings called watchers, which we know from Daniel 4, and they were some sort of an angel or divine being who was a member of God's council in heaven. You know, we've also seen that Jewish writers in the second temple period, they viewed the offsprings of Genesis 6 in the same way, calling them giants. That's right. And really, any analysis of the term Nephilim must account for and not ignore or violate these contexts. You got to take it all into account interpretation of the word Nephilim needs to include the Jewish translation of the Old Testament into Greek, which is the Septuagint. I've heard some people teach against the Septuagint. Do you know why? Yeah, they assume it's a bad interpretation of Scripture, but it was quoted by many of the New Testament authors in many places. If you have ever seen a quotation of Scripture that was in the Old Testament being quoted in the New Testament, and it seems to be worded a little differently, it's because the people in the New Testament time were quoting from the Septuagint. Oh, I'll be. I had noticed that before, but had no clue as to why the quotes were different. That's what's going on there. The word Nephilim, it occurs twice in the Hebrew Bible. You'll find it in Genesis 6 and 4, and you find it also in Numbers 13 and 33. Let me point these out to you one by one. Numbers 13 and 33. And there we saw the giants, the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which were come of the giants, the Nephilim. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Genesis 6 and 4, and there were giants in the earth in those days. These giants are the Nephilim. These are not the sons of God, but it's the offspring of them. In the Septuagint, when you look at it, when it translates this word Nephilim, it translates it in the Greek word gigas, which means giant. Okay, given that then, it would seem obvious that Nephilim ought to be understood as giants. Well, that's where I'm at. But many people argue that it should be read as the fallen ones. Now, where does that come from? Well, this is based on the idea that the word comes from the Hebrew verb nephal, which means to fall. Okay, so it means to fall down or to come down. Most people who argue that Nephilim should be translated as the fallen ones rather than giants, they do so to avoid the quasi-divine nature of the Nephilim. Wow. So how do they think that will help their stance? To me, the fallen ones seem to imply the fallen angels. That's the way I look at it, too. They believe it makes it easier for them to argue that the sons of God that Scripture talks about were actually human beings. Well... Pushing the name fallen ones doesn't disprove a supernatural interpretation in itself. As a matter of fact, to me, it helps explain their condition and why this great sin happened. So this brings me to another question I've wondered about. So I'll ask you. All right, go ahead. Why is Genesis 6, 1 through 4 included in the Bible? What is its theological message or does it have one? 
The Bible tells us that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. But is this an exception? Okay, there's a lot to say right there, and, and I'll try to get all of that in. If it is an exception, could someone explain to me what Peter and Jude were talking about while they were concerned about this issue? If it's really an exception to the rule, why were they worried about it? I believe there are many things that can be brought out of this that's still relevant for us today. One reason I believe we should take this portion of Scripture serious is this. All of your Orthodox Jews and all of your Messianic Jews teach the origin of sin from Genesis 3 like we do, but they also teach the fall of man as a threefold event. Oh, really? Where do they get that idea from? Well, they get it from Scripture, and what they mean by that is they believe Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11 are the three steps that led to the total fall of mankind. Okay, but that is the sin by Adam and Eve, the sin of Genesis 6, and the sin that happened at Babel. That's right, and in each instance of these sins, God banished man from his presence. Well, okay, I know that God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and I know that he divided the nations at Babel. So... How did God banish mankind in the Genesis 6 account? Well, it destroyed the earth with a flood, which banished the unbelievers from the presence of the believers. Good point. And I reckon they really had a solid foundation for their argument. Now, let's think through some of the things we've studied up to this point just to refresh our memories. The Mesopotamians taught about the Op Kalu. They were the great culture heroes of a pre-flood knowledge. They were the divine sages of a glorious bygone era. Babylonian kings claimed to be descendants of the Op Kalu from before the flood. They made the claim that Babylon was the sole possessor of divine knowledge and their empire's rule had the approval of the gods on it. Well, the people God used to write the Bible and all true Israelites disagreed with their version on these things. They saw Babylonian knowledge as having demonic origins. That's right. And as a matter of fact, the Op Kalu themselves were very much intertwined with Mesopotamian demonology. The Babylonians taught that the Nephilim were giant quasi-divine offspring that was fathered by the original pre-flood Op Kalu. I guess the part that most people find hard to swallow about this is that the flood came to destroy these Nephilim, but they were still on earth after the flood. Some people say Noah must have been a Nephilim for this to have been possible. How would you try to refute this argument, or do you believe it? I believe that there were giants. I believe that there were men of renown, as the Bible said, both before and after the flood. I do strongly disagree that Noah was a descendant of the Nephilim. God wanted all Nephilim destroyed. So why would he save one in the flood? Well, I get that. But how were there Nephilim after the flood then? I'm fixing to try to explain that, but I need to lay a little foundation first. These beings and their offspring were not of the true God. They were the result of a rebellion against God by lesser divine beings. What we've read in Genesis 6 and 1 through 4, what we read about 2 Peter in the book of Jude, they all portray this as a horrific transgression, and it was the catalyst that spread corruption throughout mankind. As a matter of fact, Genesis 6 and 5 is essentially a summary of the effect of this transgression. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's why it repented the Lord that he even made man, as it says in verse 6. So now Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 6 gets very little space in the Bible, but the second temple Jewish literature, they go after this stuff full bore. Okay, well, if it was such a big deal, why, why doesn't the Bible say more about it? Okay, let me come back at you with this. How often do you read about Adam and Eve's sin that happened in the Garden of Eden within the Bible? You would think that the origin of sin, where sin took place and how it took place, would be brought up over and over and over. But it isn't mentioned very many times in Scripture either. Now, it is mentioned, and it's referred to several times, but it isn't just brought out and rehashed over and over and over. It isn't that every biblical writer has to take the account of Adam and Eve and prove that there was a sin. Everybody takes that assumption and builds from it. First Enoch chapter 8 explains how some of the watchers corrupted mankind by giving them forbidden divine knowledge. Since the Babylonian Op Kalu were considered demonic, it's no mystery why Peter and Jude would link the events of Genesis 6 and 1 through 4 to devilish false teachers in 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. These false teachers are described as licentious. There are men who indulge in defiling lust. You see that in 2 Peter 2 and 2, 2 Peter 2 and 10, and Jude verse 8. Just like the divine beings of Genesis 6 who kept not their own habitation, Jude 6 tells us that these people or these beings 
defected from the loyal Elohim of God's divine counsel, and they despised authority. They blasphemed the authorities, according to 2 Peter 2 and 9 through 11 and Jude verses 8, 9, and 10. Well, I can see easily how it all fits nicely together, and it really puts a different spin on the way I've always believed this. Well, I'm not really just trying to put a different spin on Scripture here. This is historically proven. This is cultural beliefs, and it's scriptural accounts all being combined together. So it's not a new spin. It's just a different way of looking at something that we've always believed and maybe looking at different elements of it. Now, as a matter of fact, those who follow the type of lifestyle that we read of in these passages of Second Peter in the book of Jude, they could be called the seed of the serpent, or as Jesus preferred to call them, vipers. The divine transgressions that happened in Genesis 6 and Genesis 3, they're all part of a theological framework that sets the tone for the rest of the Bible. This is how we interpret what sin is and how bad it can be. These two accounts and another one that we're about to examine are part of the supernatural worldview that the Israelites had, and it also affects the very place where Christianity was born. Once again, what's the main point in all this? Taken together, these three episodes that the Jews believe, Genesis 3, Genesis 6, and Genesis 11, give the theological reasoning about the futility and danger of trying to recover Eden on any other terms than what God has set. You do realize that the Tower of Babel, that's what they were trying to do by building a tower to heaven. Yeah. They were trying to replace Eden. Yeah. After Eden, God still intended to dwell with humanity, but there would be opposition. The enemies of God who hate him and his rule and this means divine or human, they would fight against this plan, they'd fight against God's purpose, and they'd fight the will of God. Heaven and earth were destined to be reunited because it's God's will, but it would never happen without a struggle. Well, you still haven't answered my question concerning how there was Nephilim after the flood. There are several words in Genesis 6 that an Israelite would have picked up on that would help inform his reading of the other passages within the Torah. He would have picked up on things we miss. Okay, verse 4 has some of that within it. I want you to pay close attention. I'm going to read it, then I'm going to come back and accentuate some parts. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Listen to this. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, you wondered how there was Nephilim after the flood. There were giants in those days and also after that. So in other words, before the flood and after the flood, the sons of God, they came into daughters of men. They bare children. They became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Oh, my goodness. You know, out of all the times I've read this verse, I've never paid any attention to it saying, and also after that. I mean, it's there as plain as day. It is, but it's so easy to overlook that as having very little meaning to it. But it means right here before the flood and after it, these things were happening. Wow. The giants, which is the Hebrew word Nephilim, they're called mighty men, these warriors. There's also called Giborim, okay? Giborim is a Hebrew word, which means men of renown, and it means men of the name. Okay, that's another Hebrew word, Shem. The terms Gibor, Giborim, and Shem appears in several places in the Old Testament. After the flood, Nimrod, whose name literally means rebellion, he's called a Gibor or a mighty man. Well, I know that many false religions exalt Nimrod as if he's some kind of a god. They really do. In many places, they'll worship Nimrod. Nimrod is also the founder of the civilizations of Assyria and Babylon. You see that in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 12. Once again, the Mesopotamian context is apparent because Assyria and Babylon are the two civilizations that will come up and fight against Israel over and over and over. Yeah, you know, it was these two nations who dismantled the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah and divided them into two separate entities. That's right, and it wasn't by accident, for it links Babylon back to Genesis 6 and the divine transgression over and over where the devil intended to split God from his people. The Nimrod description in Genesis 10 is found also along with the table of nations. There were 70 nations at that time in the world. And all of this serves as a theological bridge between Genesis 6 and 1 through 4 and one of the biggest events in the history of the world. My, now that's a pretty big statement you just made right there. Well, the Tower of Babel is about much more than just a construction project gone wrong. It's not just about some people having a confusion between how to understand one another. There was a lot going on here. It was at Babylon, right in the Mesopotamian country of Babylon, where the people sought to make a name, Shem, 
for themselves. How? By building a tower that reached to the heavens. What's in the heavens? Well, that's where the gods are. Remember, they believed that Marduk was the high god. The people of Babel has always believed that Marduk was the great god. The children of Israel knows that there's only one true god. And so they were trying to reach heaven, but they was going about it the wrong way. Well, the city of Babel is viewed as a source of sinister activity and knowledge. That's right. Let me read you the first nine verses of Genesis 11. Make a couple comments. We'll need to close this study. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar, and they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth." I hope you noticed in verse 7, there's some plural speech made by the Lord. The Lord says, go to let us go down, just like we saw back in Genesis 1 and 26. Let us make man in our own image. I sure did, and I find that intriguing. Well, as it did in Genesis 1 and 26, it goes on, and it talks about the Lord doing something, and it says the work singular. So the Lord, singular, scattered them. That's Genesis 11 and 8. So we see that God moving is like one acting. But when God speaks of himself, he speaks in a plurality. This shows the Trinity again right here in here and in Scripture. It's at this point that most Bible readers presume there's nothing more to think about concerning this incident that happened at Babel, though. Several other Old Testament passages speak of this event, but we tend to skip over them or maybe ignore them, or maybe we just leave them out of the discussion of theology. We just think it's not important. Maybe we're not seeing them. Well, I guess I didn't realize this is mentioned several other times within Scripture. Well, the most important of these Scriptures that do mention it is found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. It's found in verse 8 and 9. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. If you'll notice, this is speaking about a time when God separated the people that was on the earth, when he allotted to them and divided to them their inheritance. He gave them what they deserved. This is exactly what he's talking about is Babel here in Genesis 11. Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9 explains that God dispersed the nations at Babel, and this resulted in him disinheriting all of the nations as his own people. Well, that makes this the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 1, 18 through 25, I guess, where God gave them over and gave them up because of their rebellion. It's very similar. As a matter of fact, it's very similar. And I would say that there's a good correlation between them. The statement that in Deuteronomy 32 and 9 makes that the Lord's portion is his people, it shows us a contrast in ownership. That's what we're needing to see here is God is saying, I've got a people. Those are not my people. So this is showing a stark comparison that at one time all people was under God. Now there's only one group that's actually part of him. This shows a separation between one group and the whole world. Doesn't that sound like holiness theology? Yeah. It was at this point the Lord decided that the people of the world's nations were no longer going to be in relationship to him. Well, he had already destroyed the world with the flood because of sin. And now because he promised to never destroy the earth with a flood again, I guess he chose to disinherit those sinful nations. In other words, I guess you could say that he would start over. He would choose him out of people from the other peoples of the earth and enter into a relationship with them by covenant, which we know as Israel. Now think about that statement you just made for a moment. Is that not what we preach as the gospel message? Yes. God chooses a particular group of people to be his from out of all the other people on the earth, and he's entered into a marriage covenant with them. And we call that the church now. Well, that definitely seems to be what this is all about, doesn't it? It does. And the implication of this decision is really crucial to our understanding the plan of God is will in both the Old and the New Testaments. Yeah, and I guess we'll be discussing this in next week's study because 
Hey, we're out of time. Well, actually, next week we're going to be looking at something to go along with Good Friday. But the week after, we'll be returning to this topic once again. All right, friends. If you have a Bible question or a question regarding how news and current events or things going on within our culture are connected to Scripture, drop us an email at dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. That is dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. We hope you've enjoyed this episode today, sharing God's Word. But until the next time, may God bless you all. Be sure and come back Monday, March the 25th, for episode number 161, The Good Shepherd versus the False Shepherds. But for me, this I know. Will it change my heart all around? Put my feet back on the ground, got along. Now for heaven, I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. To that land where the milk and honey flow. Oh, I've heard of such a place. I can't go there by God's grace. Never seen it, but I know I want to go.